quickly as possible through the slides. Uh, I will be able to just touch on on a few of the areas, uh, just way way of background. My name's Steve Litster. I've been at AWS now for a couple of years. Um, for the last 30 years, I've been involved in some small molecule drug discovery, both in academia and commercial sector. And before joining AWS, I actually managed the scientific computing group at Novartis for 14 years. So pleased to meet everybody. Um, I'll try to pause between each section in case there's any questions in that space. Uh, but first, I wanted to, to just start off by, you know, here's the, the high level agenda. Um, and, you know, in the healthcare life science space, we've seen a number of changes in the, in the last decade, whereby, you know, the challenges around sort of data growth, collaboration, reproducibility, you know, these areas are really coming to the forefront. Um, and actually no more so than the last couple of years, as, as we've seen with COVID and COVID research. Um, so what I'll, I'll talk today about is some of the, the early challenges, but really begin to focus on some of those use cases and what we call out of the possible use cases, where we believe we're really pushing the boundaries in this space. So I'm going to start off full screen here. There we are. So, you know, as, as we start to think about high performance computing over the last decade, we really begin to see a change in these platforms that tended to be standalone, highly specialized, where you know 90% of the users were Unix experts or Linux experts, and they could uh, code on command line. And you know, with the emergence of next generation sequencing genomics around a decade ago, we now saw or uh, began to see high performance computing move away from this specialized platform more into a high throughput computing uh, with processing genomics data, uh, which was being generated at terabytes per day. And then we saw, started to see the addition of imaging. And now we're beginning to see the addition of AI ML platforms on top of this to actually accelerate what we've seen in the imaging space, computational chemistry and modeling and simulation. So what we've been doing at AWS is really beginning to focus on those scientific workloads in addition to the high performance computing platform and begin to take the, the vision of high performance computing beyond just infrastructure and how do we start to optimize the infrastructure for the application layer rather than the other way around. Um, and some of the other areas that are becoming very prevalent in this space now. So we know cloud has been you know one of the drivers of driving so accelerated insights uh accelerating time to insight just because of the scale and the dynamic resourcing that's available from instance types and storage platforms but what we are beginning to see more and more of now is high performance computing high throughput computing and ai ml it's become this ubiquitous framework throughout life sciences from research and discovery which i'll focus on today but all the way through to clinical trials manufacturing commercial and post-patient care so now we're beginning to see that we have to be much more secure and compliant that data needs to be reproducible for anywhere from 20 to 30 years are the results additionally you know high performance computing was really a platform that we never really started to build um, high availability or disaster recovery around. This is now crucial. Um, so if your high performance computing platform is unavailable, typically your labs are going to be unavailable, your sequencing labs, your imaging labs. So it's now becoming much more prevalent and much more important that we build this redundancy into the platforms to enable the scientists uh, to move forward. Uh, and again, central to all this is we're finally beginning to see organizations move to that data-driven drug discovery uh, pipeline. So we've spoken about this for many years, but we really have been limited in the ability of, you know, data that's stored in multi-petabyte file systems. How do we mine that data? How do we extract that metadata and turn this unstructured data into knowledge and, and insights. So we are really beginning to see this data driven and we're working backwards from those data driven models and finding where we can apply high, HPC, high throughput computing and AI ML to accelerate drug discovery, which is becoming more and more difficult in this space. And actually the startups are playing a major role in this because of their agility um, and focus on the very specialized areas. And hopefully some of the examples we'll give later on, uh, you'll be able to see some of this. Um, 
So as I mentioned earlier, we're beginning to see this consolidation of platforms. So high high performance computing. There was also the the big data revolution probably five six years ago, and really we're beginning to see that fold in. Um, and a couple of examples here where we've seen organizations and startups beginning to embrace this combination of methods, uh, none more clearly than I'd say Moderna, who literally within 42 days of the the spike protein or the COVID, um, so the COVID sequence being identified, they were able to actually to, to use uh, three-dimensional structures and actually start to advance the development of the COVID vaccine literally within about 42 days. So this is a, a great use case and where we're beginning to see those agile organizations leverage cloud to accelerate um, drug discovery and hopefully uh, accelerate patient care. Or time to patient care. Um, another one I just want to mention, and again, this is linked into AIML and some of the, the new initiatives that we've seen. Uh, one here is called the Aon Labs, which is a, a, a unique first of a kind alliance between global partners and startup organizations where we're working together to try and drive AIML, um, HPC, and high throughput computing platforms to help in the discovery and acceleration of drug discovery as well so again uh, we can send the links on this is a, a phenomenal initiative being run out of israel right now um, but these are the areas that we're beginning to focus on uh, within aws um, and especially in the startup space as well to help accelerate this this area and make it easier for organizations to move forward in the in the drug discovery space so what I'm going to be talking about today, I'm going to briefly touch on a couple of these. Um, we, we could probably actually do a workshop for two to three hours. And if that's if that's of interest in any of these areas, uh, we're happy to, to follow up with you. So what we've been doing over the last couple of years is in addition to focusing on the infrastructure, we're really beginning to look at the scientific workflows. How do we make it easier to deploy scientific workflows? So we're beginning to develop these frameworks that really gets the end user, the scientists or the engineer and the IT organizations 50 to 80% of the way there with pre-configured frameworks or base frameworks that we can now work on top of. So these include things like connected lab, you know, how do you move that genomics data and imaging data into the cloud how do you how do scientists interact with that in a dynamic interactive manner as well um, so that's connected lab a uh, couple that I'll, I'll focus on today are genomics and precision medicine and some of the work and innovation in that space and one i've been personally working on uh, just by way of background i'm actually a crystallographer is a structure-based drug design um, and we've seen amazing innovation in the last couple of years in that space. Um, so where we're beginning to push the boundaries. Um, other follow-up items, and we've got lots of resources and links to the following around image analysis and insights, knowledge graph, which is an emerging technology in the AIML space, um, deep graph library, uh, and Patrick may follow up on that with the AI, AIML presentation. Um, and then as we start to move into, you know, where compute is going with computer quantum computing and the application to AI ML and actually even to areas like quantum chemistry codes as well. And as we mentioned, as we begin to focus on the science, now we look at beginning to map those scientific workflows now to the infrastructure. So we find in the the optimal and tuned infrastructure to match the workloads. Uh, and I'm just briefly going to touch on some of the services here. So if we look at compute and storage, um, many different arrays of CPUs, GPUs, and now with FPGAs, but also the storage space. Uh, we're definitely beginning to see the growth of, say, S3 as a pivotal data lake foundation because of the extensible metadata. So now when we start to think of combining our genomics data with imaging data, and maybe even our computational chemistry and small molecule assay data, we're looking at multimodal analysis, multimodal data analysis. How do I start to search across the metadata from these various scientific verticals and combine those? And the power of an object store such as S3 allows us now to structure our data in such a manner where we can rapidly find it and create those connections. This is much more difficult to do in a file-centric, uh, file-centric uh, high-performance computing or high-throughput computing environment. Um, we'll have a couple of examples there. 
Um, but again, looking at traditional HPC, you know, many of the problems we see are these massive data loads, uh, exploding data types, and we need to process that process that data as quickly as possible. Um, so we've seen a very traditional storage system like uh, Luster. Uh, now we have a fully managed service around FSX for Luster. These high performance computing workloads, especially when you're doing sort of parallel reads and writes. Um, so what we've been doing is matching these various workloads moving through the pipelines, combining the infrastructure with the application stack, and then putting on top of that different orchestration mechanisms, such as parallel cluster, batch. We're now beginning to see the emergence of containers around EKS and ECS, and how we start to look at the modernization of these platforms to drive throughput and actually derive those insights from the data as well. So I'm just going to pause there just in case there's any questions. In, in that in that space and if not i can carry on and please feel free to to post the messages in the the chime window as well uh, so one of the areas uh, we've seen grow and this has continued to grow over the last decade is in the genomics and precision medicine space and again this uh, is a, an amazing oh sorry yeah definitely yeah there is a question there what uh, about about the biologics yes. from vincent yeah. perfect great great question i'm actually going to touch on that with the, the cryo em so as as we mentioned earlier, you know, discovery of small molecules uh, and those those blockbuster small molecule drugs is becoming more and more difficult. And we are now beginning to see the emergence of biologics. Um, so with the things like antibody design, epitope design, um, and some of these new techniques that we see in emerge, especially in the structure based drug discovery area is helping to drive those forward and i'll touch on that with cryo em but yes biologics is emerging it's a it's a very complex space i'm certainly not an expert on biologics uh, but we are working with a number of organizations especially in you know when you start to think of um take going from primary sequence and can you start to predict you know this the secondary and tertiary structures of rna and biologics and peptides and this is where we begin to see the application of high performance computing and ai ml come together um, and I'll, I'll, I'll briefly touch on that uh, in a couple of slides and where we're going um and again in the so we're just going back to genomics and precision medicine space we've you know we've seen the growth of data which is very problematic. Many of these instruments are outpacing the, the speed and scale that IT can keep up in. So how do we start to accelerate the um, one, the data collection, the data process and the data transfer and analysis? And more importantly, uh, we're beginning to see now increased collaboration between sort of the commercial sector, academia and public sector. And this really took off in the last two years between with COVID driving uh, these initiatives, as we start to look at the application of biobanks like the UK Biobank or Genomics England, working with commercial entities and academic, academic entities to derive algorithms to really start pulling more and more of that information from the data. And additionally, um, one of the resources that I mentioned at the end of this is the Registry of Open Data. How do we share this data more effectively? As we start to think about now, how do we standardize the genomics data such that um, if I'm collaborating, that we, we're using consistent metadata? And one of the areas in this space we're beginning to see emerge are things like the, you know, the Gen3 Data Commons platform as well. And again, if this is an area that we're interested in, um, we've have a number of blogs on standardization of metadata for genomics and how we're beginning to extend that now across chemical data and also imaging data too. What was it I've just said? Ah, yes, the uh, the antibody design uh, AIML. Um, I well, I can definitely follow up with you on that. We have a number of initiatives in that space, um, and I'll, I'll I may touch that in a while. Um, so again, just going back to to genomics, we're beginning to see lab automation where it's now of the realm now to see 500,000 to a million uh, sequences collected in a lab or from contract research organizations. Collaboration is driving this. Increased contract research organizations sharing data and moving data into pharma and more importantly, reproducibility. Uh, there was a recent paper in Nature uh, two years ago where they were show, highlighting that only 30% of bioinformatics workloads are reproducible. 
This is a huge problem as you're driving from research all the way through to patient care and clinical care. Um, so how do we make these more reproducible? And this is where we begin to now look at infrastructure's code. So it's not just the applications that we need to reproduce, is can we generate that same infrastructure? Um, so in this slide, I'm just trying to highlight the, the various uh, approaches to scaling genomic workloads. Um, but this is applicable to imaging, computational chemistry, and AIML, whereby we start with what we typically call a, a lift and shift environment, where you may have an on-premise HPC environment or AIML platform. And how do we make that as seamless as possible for the end user so they're up and running? So this is where we may be looking at things like burst of on-premises, where we, we extend the job orchestrator like LSF or Altair or Slurm to launch jobs into the cloud, uh, utilizing things like FSx for Luster, Parallel Cluster, for example. So that's the same um, user experience. But then as we start to move forward and we look at scale, how do we start to move this to a more modern platform, which is more API driven, REST API driven? And now we begin to look at AWS native, the adoption of step functions, the scaling of AWS batch, and really beginning to leverage S3 as that data platform and start to utilize this metadata and drive this. Um, I'd say probably 80 to 90% of the genomic workloads that we now begin to see in AWS have moved away from that lift and shift model and are moving more into the cloud native approach. But with the application of other third party tools, such as Cromwell from the Broad Institute or the NextFlow platform from Sakara. And again, now we start to build these reproducible workloads, which pull in both the data and the applications in a reproducible manner. And again, so all these options are available depending on the level of comfort the scientists or the IT departments want to adopt, moving all the way through to some sort of third party managed service, SaaS and, and platform as a service uh, solutions uh, that we see from DNA Nexus, Seven Bridges and Illumina. Um, and Illumina is an interesting use case as they've adopted these accelerator technologies like FPGAs, which we've been seeing growing over the years and we're looking at the promise of FPGAs, but now we're actually really beginning to see the uptake of these accelerator technologies driving forward genomic analysis. Um, similarly from NVIDIA with Parabricks, and these are available say within the AWS marketplace where you can actually bring a container in and be up and running relatively quickly for you know, high throughput uh, genomic scaling. So I just wanted to create a, a, an overview there. But where, uh, you know, a really good example um, of where this technology has been applied and is still being applied is with AstraZeneca, uh, who set a goal of uh, processing and analyzing 2 million genomes um, by 2026. So working together with our professional services group, AstraZeneca, and in tight collaboration with Illumina and the Dragon platform, we were able actually to increase the processing time or improve processing time by about 2,400%, uh, taking that processing of 20,000 samples from 20 days to 20 hours. Um, and this was actually a result from last year. We're, we're now actually increasing that throughput even more with the addition of um, you know things like fsx for luster increasing the the throughput of the io and actually expanding that model and really leveraging the various availability zones and regions to process this data more in a, in a global manner as well the second area i wanted to focus on is structure-based drug design and this is where we are beginning to see now um, these techniques apply to biologics in addition to the small molecules. So these three areas uh, that I'm going to very briefly cover. So we've got the target identification, target validation space, where we're beginning to look at things like cryo microscopy and protein folding, then moving through to, to lead discovery and optimization through virtual screening and molecular dynamics. So many of these techniques have been around for many years. However, we are beginning to see now the adoption of cloud, which takes these workloads from a tactical to a strategic scale and analysis that we've not been able to do before. So if you take uh, cryo-electron microscopy, so for anybody not familiar with cryo-electron microscopy, 
This is where you take a, a protein, an enzyme, or a virus, or even biologics in solution, freeze them, and expose them to a very intense electron beam. Um, what comes out of that is a, a diffraction pattern. And, and after many phases of process and analysis, what you get out of this is a three-dimensional structure of that virus, that enzyme, or protein. And this allows us now, if we wanted to bind a small molecule or a biologic with cryo-EM, you can actually see where it's bound and you can actually start to capture transition states. So cryo-electron microscopy, we begin to see as this emerging technique um, for capturing structures and three-dimensional structures, which may not be accessible from X-ray crystallography. Um, again, this is a very rapid technique, but the challenges involved are massive data production. You know, a single instrument can generate anywhere from one to four terabytes of raw data per day. Um, with the new optics coming through, as we start to see Thermo Fisher developing more of uh, advanced techniques and these electron beams become more powerful, you know, we could certainly expect that data to start to double or even uh, treble within the next 18 months. So how do we start to cope with 12 to 18 terabytes of data coming off a single instrument, but being able to process that at the speed of science? So when do the scientists need those results back? And again, it was so important, as we saw with the Moderna case, within 42 days, going from sequence to an mRNA uh, vaccine within that space of time, this is the accelerator now we're beginning to see within the life science community, whereby you know the traditional 10 to 15 years at two to five billion for the production of a single drug or a single treatment, um, we need to be able to accelerate this. And cryo-EM is one of those areas that we are beginning to work on. Um, so what we've done, we've partnered with a, a team called uh, Structure Biotechnology, who've developed a very high throughput mechanism called CryoSpark for elucidating these three-dimensional structures. Um, and again, with, with cryo-EM, these multiple phases, some, some parts of the, the pipeline will use CPUs, others will use GPUs, you may use a combination. Uh, some may be able to read object store, some may be able to use file systems. So it's really important that we have this flexible model in place. Um, so one of the, the simple architectures that we designed for processing this data is based on, on parallel cluster. So on the left here, you see the microscope as that data is being collected. We then use something, uh, either data sync or a storage gateway. There's a number of options there to move that data primarily into an S3 bucket. So this is a really important point, and this goes back to the Data Lake initiative, where we can now start to tag data at source and leverage the extensible metadata tagging within object stores and S3. So our data stays there, and then we can move that down to a lower tier. So in addition to so lowering the cost, because these data sets are becoming incredibly large, we now have much more control over how we access that data, process that data, who has access to that data, and how do we start to combine this across multiple types of scientific verticals. So in the case of cryo-EM, um, and I'll show some benchmarks, we really focused on how do we optimize, one, the workflow, but also control costs. So this is an area we're focusing on in terms of balancing and uh, basically publishing of the, the price or the cost per scientific unit, rather than thinking about the, the total cost of ownership of infrastructure, we're now beginning to see if we can translate this more into the scientific impact. So in this case, with parallel clusters, we'll see on the next slide, we look at the, the HBC environment and FSX for Luster as ephemeral. So as that data comes in, we spin up this large infrastructure, which could be vary from one GPU to eight GPUs or thousands of CPUs. But again, this is just ephemeral. Using parallel cluster, we can scale that architecture up or down depending on which phase of that pipeline is, is coming through. Um, and so th this is an example of what we did with a test data set. So this is a relatively small cryo-EM data set, um, around 3,500 movies, around 500 gigabytes of data. But these are the workloads and the type of benchmarks we are now beginning to publish. Um, what this highlights, so the, the graph on the left, for example, is if you used a, a single G4DN instance, uh, you could actually finish that process in time in around 12 hours uh, for a cost of $50 or $51. And then if we take the extreme case, we're now where we're looking at the most powerful GPU we have is the, the A100 on the far right, 
we're using all eight GPUs at once to process the data, you can actually lower that time to three hours, but the cost increases to about $91. So again, we're optimizing and providing benchmarks across a variety of platforms and instances, which now enable the scientists or the IT departments to start making more um, conscious decisions on how they would like to run this infrastructure. Um, and we have a number of videos uh, on that space as well. Uh, rapidly following on uh, from Cryo EM, um, I, Unfortunately, I don't have a complete slide deck on this. Uh, we could actually talk for a couple of hours on it. But a recent release, and I think this may be interesting to a number of people on the line, is we've been hearing about AlphaFold 2 and the impact of you know, taking primary sequences and moving this or using AI ML techniques to drive three-dimensional structure. Um, again, this is incredibly important as well in the biologic space now, as we start to look at peptides and RNA. And actually the binding of these structures um, I was actually at a conference a couple of weeks ago now where they're actually beginning to use AlphaFold 2 for simulating or capturing a biologic bound to a, a protein or an enzy, enzyme and they're beginning to now um, transform or create three-dimensional structures from two primary sequences which is a fascinating evolution. Uh, again though with protein folding this is a multi-phase approach Whereas on the left um, is very much CPU intensive, and then on the right is very GPU intensive. Um, so how do we start to balance these? How do we make this easier for the scientists to interact? And I've created, uh, put the link at the bottom here, um, but this is a new reference architecture for groups who, if they're interested in running AlphaFold 2, uh, you can actually connect to Jupyter Notebook and interact with these sequences now and start to generate three-dimensional structures using AWS Batch. Um, so it's a containerized solution. Um, and again, this is a rapidly deployed architecture that you can deploy within your VPC and then start to elucidate these three-dimensional structures. Um, and again, you'll, you'll notice a common pattern here in terms of we try to create these simplified architectures where you can actually scale up or down the CPUs or GPUs, whether you're using batch or parallel cluster, um, but also leveraging the object stores of S3 and leverage and also the high performance of things like FSX for Lustre file system. Um, so that, that is an emerging uh, technology. The blog was literally came out three weeks ago. Uh, this is a very exciting space, especially now when we're combining this with Cryo EM for target identification and validation. Uh, and I'll go very quickly through the next couple of slides. Um, just wanted to highlight now what, what we're doing in the virtual screening space. Um, so once we have this target, how do we start to bind these molecules? So if you think of that enzyme or virus as a, as a lock, the small molecules as the keys, you know, do these keys unlock the protein? Or do they, sorry, do they, uh, yes, do they unlock the protein? Do they activate it? Do they deactivate it? So, you know, think of virtual screening as a lock and key model where you're trying millions of keys in the lock and what activity or what happens to that small molecule, what's the effect on the protein of the virus? Um, and we've seen this extensively again with COVID as we start to look at antivirals and how they interact with so the, uh, the um, COVID spike protein. Um, so in this case, we actually collaborated with Harvard Medical who created an open source application for virtual screening called Virtual Flow, um, whereby we're now beginning to look in the computational chemistry space. So rather than thinking of screening millions of molecules per day, can we now start to think of a much larger strategic approaches? Start to think of, can we screen anywhere from five to 10 billion molecules and cover a much larger area of this small molecule chemical space? Um, so again, this is an open source project. Uh, so what we did, uh, we, we found that using a traditional lift and shift model, we may not be able to scale past about 10,000 CPUs. So uh, our solution architect team, they worked with the Harvard team, converted the, the virtual flow applications or components into containers, which now allows us to leverage batch and also leverage S3 for scaling out. Um, so this was just a, an example of the process where we went from, you know, 9,000 CPUs up to 1.1 uh, million CPUs. Uh, more recently, as, as presented at reInvent, we were now able to scale to about two and a half million virtual CPUs on AWS Batch. So now we can actually think of uh, processing 
you know, two to three billion molecules over a period of a couple of days. So this is where we are really beginning to, to push the envelope. Um, so this is a, an, an important open source program. Um, and just as important is we, we have our uh, partner network as well. And similarly with OpenEye Scientific, who have built an Orion uh, software as a service platform on top of AWS, whereby similarly, uh, we can look at things like FastRox for 3D ligand based searching, where we're looking at you know, 2.5 billion using GPUs uh, for the cost of you know, 30 to $100, all the way through to the structure based docking, uh, which we just saw on a previous slide with virtual flow. Um, again, with OpenAI Orion now, where we can actually start to screen things like the Enamine database, um, which is, I think, in close to maybe 14 billion molecules, uh, small molecules in that space now, um, but also with MQL and the Wuxi app as well. So these are solutions going from self-managed, lift and shift, through to sort of fully managed services environments, and, and partners are um, an important piece of this environment. Um, finally, I'll just touch on a, a, another area uh, where we're beginning to focus again, molecular dynamics. So now you have your protein or your virus and you want to simulate this in maybe different solutions. And again, this has been very much limited by the availability of maybe on-premises um, infrastructure. Uh, so many of these jobs can be very long running from, from days to months. Um, and what we're beginning to do now is look at optimizing the code, but leveraging different types of infrastructure and again, offering the variety and breadth of infrastructure um, from a CPU and GPU perspective. Um, in this case, uh, we've got uh, two new additions in this space, HPC 6A, which is a highly specialized high performance computing platform based on the AMD chip, but with fast internet to allow scale out. Um, and also now the, the new G5 GPU um, which is a new addition. It's based on the, the A10 NVIDIA uh, GPU, where now we're beginning to look at scaling and benchmarking the, the G5s for not just cryo EM, but for molecular dynamics again. Um, also wanted to quickly emphasize, these are reproducible infrastructures code that I, are able to scale up and down. So you'll see a common thread coming through here where we may switch back and forth between parallel cluster, or, bat, or AWS batch as well. But again, you'll notice almost on every slide there's an S3 component because this is where now we're beginning to put the data so we can begin to search across this and have this data reproducible for the next 15, 20, 30 years. Uh, I just want to quickly highlight uh, you know, a couple of the benchmarks. So this is the, the Gromox, Gromax benchmark and these are all published. And I think this is important for us to publish these to the end users where we're actually scaling and giving different combinations so you can start to analyze your own price performance. And this is a GPU um, example. And this is the new uh, HPC 6A example uh, where we can actually approach like 45 to 50 nanoseconds a day for a 12 million atom simulation. Uh, and on the right here, you see a comparison between sort of the, C, the traditional C5N instance that have been used for molecular dynamics previously and the new HPC 6A um, application. Um, you can see actually the price performance improvement anywhere from 64 to 62%, where they can do these simulations now um, in, in terms of tens of nanoseconds a day in terms of a couple of nanoseconds a day. So I just wanted to quickly highlight that. And I'm just going to wrap up. A um, couple of areas, uh, if you're not familiar, a couple of uh, really important um, spaces that could help or they do help in the especially in the startup environment is if you're not familiar with the biotech blueprint so these are pre-configured frameworks that allow you to spin up and integrate uh, AWS services very rapidly, create a service catalog, active directory integration, but also now you can combine these quick start guides. So you can actually pull in a Parabricks quick start guide, uh, a Parabricks uh, architecture to allow you to now to start using GPUs for processing genomics data, similarly for cryo EM. Um, so again, if you're not familiar with the Biotech Blueprint, I highly recommend looking at this. This was developed with the Third Rock Ventures. Um, for example, all their startup organizations now begin to roll out this as a, as a basic template so they can quickly get up and running from a network and compute and storage perspective. Uh, and finally, I also want to mention if you're not familiar with this, there's the AWS Data Exchange, 
And this is where we see contract research organizations, ISVs, and data pro providers uh, being able to create this data so you can um, ingest this data, but potentially more importantly, uh, the registry of open data, where this is a, a free resource uh, for genomics data, imaging data, I think there's something like 92 life science data sets here, which become incredibly important if you're now beginning to develop AI ML models in this space. So I'd, I'd highly recommend um, checking out the, the Bi Biotech Blueprint space and also the Registry of Open Data and the AWS Data Exchange. And right now I'm going to pause there just to see if there's any questions before handing over to uh, one of our really important partners. Um, so I'll pause just in case there's any questions. And I'm happy also to follow up via email um, and texts uh, and anything that you may have in addition. Uh, if you want to ask questions, you have this uh, the, the chat channels or you can unmute yourself and, and speak freely. And if there are also, I think more importantly, um, so within AWS, the way we operate is actually working backwards uh, from the customer. So if there's any particular scientific workloads or areas you think we should be investigating from a scientific perspective, or if we may have, you know, blogs that may they may not be too uh, easy to find, you know, please email us. Uh, we have a number of, you know, scientific experts in many of these different fields that we can work with you on on these as well. Uh, there is a question from Gaspar Stefan. Transition using many services, batteries, Kubernetes. Oh, that, that's, a, that's a really good example. We're actually beginning to see um, the emergence now of, of Kubernetes on batch or EKS on batch. Uh, that, that's something that we're beginning to, to investigate. Um, we're not encountering limitations yet, but this is a very early area of research. Uh, but I would love to follow up with you on that. Because uh, I can certainly get our batch and Kubernetes experts uh, online with you. Um, because we, you know, what's really important, and this is where we're beginning to see things like EKS and e ECS anywhere, which allow you now to run EKS or manage and run EKS clusters and ECS clusters on premises and have them interact in a hybrid mode with cloud. Um, so if you're not familiar with EKS and ECS anywhere, um, we'd definitely be interested in following you up on that and and where this is going from a batch integration perspective. Yeah, yeah, Gaspar, we can we can we can take this with uh, with Toma, your solution architect. I will I will follow up on this. Yeah. Super. Um, actually, I can I think we can we can switch to to Anio's presentation. Super. Thank you. Wait a minute. Share my screen. Yep. Okay, it's coming. You can we can see your we can see your screen right now. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can go. Okay. Hello everybody. Uh, thank you. Thank you to Stefan uh, for this presentation. It was um, very clear and. Um, as you can see, it's a lot of information, and uh, uh, we will um, answer uh, why why Aneo is here and uh, how Aneo can uh, manage uh, and support that. Um, I'm Damien Dubuc, senior manager uh, and uh, HPC um, HTC solution architect in the cloud uh, for for Aneo, and uh, we will see uh, together uh, a presentation. Of uh, of Aneo, if I can switch my slide, yep. Um, we will show. Um, I will show you um, a presentation of Aneo and uh, some quick question. Uh, how we can boost a solution for a startup, and also uh, questions that you should ask at yourself uh, when you start a project. Uh, on uh, on the cloud, and uh, uh, if you have to migrate, for example, some project from on-premise to uh, to AWS cloud, uh, you have maybe some quick questions that you should ask for yourself. And after that, I will show you some case studies uh, 
more specific one about the uh, Gromac solution that Stefan uh, has shown uh, earlier. So uh, we will see uh, we will see how we can optimize and why we optimize. Uh, is it for for performance or for cost or for time? Um, so um, I know is a consulting company in organization and technologies. Uh, it's around 170 consultants, and we operate on all the vertical of the company that we can find in these four fundamental pillars. Uh, we we say we we talk about pillar meaning vision, transformation on the left, and on the right, advanced technologies and steering. Uh, we start with the, with the vision of a company. Uh, this is the um, the first ID, for example, is the first, the first ID we need to convert into, into a business model, a business plan, or only just a reason, a reason of being. And after that, uh, we have uh, what I call the application of the vision, meaning the transformation. For me, it's uh, uh, the application of the vision, uh, so, uh, so well-defined strategy. But um, the, stress, the, transform the transformation will not be applicable without uh, the technology and the computing power that, uh, that we have today. Um, here, here again, we, we can find cross-functional activities and business where, uh, where I'm working, uh, meaning about the HPC and HCC. Um, I like to, to, to tell you the difference between the HPC and HCC because this is not really the same optimization as the same research in terms of performances. And uh, HPC and HTC for my now, it's, um, it began at uh, 2011, and uh, we, uh, we switched the HPC and HTC uh, work into the cloud uh, after, after 2016. Um, and also about the computer vision, computer vision and AI data uh, that we uh, so it's we uh, work since uh, since 2009. So these four four pillars, these three three pillars: vision, transformation, and advanced technologies, is not relevant without uh, without steering. That's why we have the fourth fourth pillar, meaning the steering, um, with with common and common steering, meaning. Uh, project management and uh, portfolio management or the more recent style of management which is uh, value value based management and uh, more focus on value that we can use yes, that we can deliver so for a startup it's uh, it's very interesting to to, to check the verticality um, the verticality of this uh, this four pillars if we represent our activity in our pillar on strategic guideline divided by its step, the first one is also is always uh, how to support a company ideas uh, from the beginning, and this is the first step to, to transform it into a business model. The second step is to uh, to define a, a cloud strategy and a technical roadmap. Sometimes it's the first step for for architecture, and after that we have the execution of strategy. And uh, this is the time to, uh, to apply uh, directly the technical roadmap and to define a DAT uh, to, uh, to apply the, the architecture, the final and detailed architecture. After that, you have, um, that's, we consider that the most important things when you migrate your solution into the, into the cloud, it's uh, building the cost model uh, of, of the service and how we can uh, manage and anticipate uh, the cost of, of um, an execution and production inside, inside the cloud. After that, uh, and only after that, uh, this is the, first, the five, fifth step, the development and implementation support, uh, where we can provide some, some service directly. Uh, at this stage, it could be uh, the final solution that we can go into the production, meaning uh, uh, more of a, with some validation, some quality uh, checking, and some testing that we that uh, show you here. Or uh, we can also do uh, some kind of loop to uh, to loop in terms of research and development, 
and uh, the goals will be uh, to do that in, in, in collaboration with ANEO or directly uh, with AWS to uh, um, to improve your your ID or to just to improve your architecture. For example, so we can loop until the step one or the step uh, three or four, for example. Um, this is kind of uh, customers that we can address uh, during during our experiences and skills. Um, the goal is to, uh, for example, we have here uh, some hospitals, some French hospital, meaning APHP hospital, uh, French Paris hospital, and uh, another case study case studies that we can have uh, with Anero it's uh, about. Um, uh, Hospital uh, European Josh Josh We we'll see that um, just as of that. Uh, so as I said earlier, um, I think you should have some some quick question uh, to ask yourself about HPC and uh, how we can manage HPC inside the cloud because it's not really the same things as the same ID. Uh, from uh, from the on-premise solution. Uh, for example, the first one will be could be uh, how do we ensure the life cycle of, of machine? Um, and it will make sure that the VM is uh, efficiently for for your solution and adapt uh, your virtual machine for your needs. Sometimes, for example, as we have seen with uh, with uh, Stefan presentation. Sometimes some virtual machine does not uh, uh, match with uh, with the solution, and we need to check between C5n, G5n, if it's GPU or CPU. Uh, it's clearly our work to to bring you some some kind of solution for that and some kind of answer for that. Um, another another thing, is, as I said, is um, control cost. Control cost is clearly. Um, the, the best solution to do that is to uh, to manage to to limit the resources, to risk to limit the consumption. Uh, even when you start a proof of concept or a proof of value, and um, another another thing that we can have uh, kind, of kind of question is how do we manage errors. And uh, is it possible to manage directly with um, managed service from uh, AWS? Is it easy to to read it, to to check some metrics? This is kind of question you should have. And the last one, the last one, this is uh, our case study just after. It's uh, how to optimize performances. Um, under under this kind of question, you have, for example. Would, what could be uh, performance? What does that need to optimize? Is it um, is it simply uh, the cost in, in terms of uh, in terms of cloud? Is it uh, the performance usage of a CPU of a virtual CPU, or simply uh, need to reduce the time uh, time to so, to execute it? So um, for this uh, case study, we we used um, uh, the Gromac code, and uh, uh, the objective is uh, this case study is to to be able to simulate and verify real time the shape of protein and check optimal environment condition for the protein to live. Uh, the more the more time we can observe the protein, the more we can guarantee that the protein is stable and does not uh, distort. Uh, in uh, in a given uh, environment, if the if the protein is distorted and does not have sufficiently identical shape over time, then the environment is not conformed and the life for the protein for the life of the protein, and the test uh, test is uh, clearly a failure. So uh, for that, uh, just to know if you if you have not that in mind, uh, when we simulate a protein. Uh, uh, for one microsecond, it's more or less seven or eight months to, to simulate the life, the lifetime 
of a protein during one microsecond. So it's very, very huge. And uh, if uh, this, uh, this protein is distorted uh, during, for example, after two months, um, the main execution of, the, of our client will be, uh, will be to, to stop it after, after this failure. But at the moment, it doesn't see in real time uh, the visualization of this protein and uh, does not stop the execution and wait at the end of the execution, of, meaning after seven months to, um, to, uh, to get the results of the simulation. Um, we, uh, we, we have acted on two axes in terms of optimization, in terms of performances. Uh, the first one, as I said, is to be able to check in real time the deformation of the protein in order to stop the execution if the test is a failure. And the second one is uh, to execute in parallel several sets of protein independent of each other. Uh, without, without cloud and without a solution brain by AWS, I'm pretty sure it won't be possible. Uh, we, we used multiple uh, virtual machines to test it, multiple services to test it, and without this panel of solution, we, we, we didn't achieve maybe one person of this project. Um, so the main uh, success of this, of this story is to save maybe maybe five months of uh, computing uh, computing execution uh, with um, I think um, six hundred uh, six thousand sorry six thousand vCPU. Uh, C5N uh, running uh, 24 on 24. So uh, this is the main main best case for us. And as we have seen uh, for the for the customers, you can check um, the evolution of the protein during during the simulation. Another other case studies that we have in in the healthcare it's. Uh, uh, molecule docking, uh, representing by seven millions of tasks uh, sent to the cloud, just to check if some atoms, some some molecules are correctly uh, uh, correctly fit together. And it it will be it was uh, six hundred thousand VCPU, and we have also also other uh, studies uh, like Yeshu with antibiogram analysis and classification. And another that we have uh, presented with Michel uh, one year, one uh, one hour ago, about um, about HPV and uh, a special pass uh, to uh, to check uh, carcinoma and cancer. That's it. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, uh, if you have any question, I can I can answer you in, in English and in French. Is there any question? Um, okay, so um, thank you very much, everyone, for your time. Uh, as I told you, we are running um, a series of webinars through 2022. Uh, and to improve ourselves, this is a quick link uh, to be able to, uh, to evaluate the session. So we will use your feedback uh, to, to improve the next, uh, the next session. So please go there and, uh, and, uh, and answer this question so, so we can improve ourselves. Um, and just if you are uh, asking yourself what you can do as follow-up with us, um, I think you can see my screen now. Uh, there is there there are some some follow-ups that you that we can go together. The first one on on the top uh, side um, of this slide, you have the the credits. So what AWS could finance with you to help you to move forward on your HPC workloads. So basically we can find spot credits, AWS services. Uh, we need to evaluate you, um, how you will uh, use services, and then we can finance this uh, services for, for one month, for instance. What we can do also is finance uh, the partner. So if you want to move forward with NAO on one of your workloads, we can finance uh, all of 
the, the, the mission or 50% of the mission with the Jumpstart program. Uh, it it will help you to move forward and benefit from uh, from annual um, expertise uh, to help you to move forward uh, faster. And then, what you can do with AWS is uh, mentorship sessions. So if you go to Startup Loft, uh, if you need, I can send you the links. You have uh, business hours or technical hours where you can book uh, a specific uh, on specific subjects. One special, one AWS specialist. Uh, actually, it's free, and you can do uh, online on AWS Startup Loft. Uh, you can also join us on the AWS Summit which will happen in France on the 12th of April. And you will have AIML and HPC experts if you want to uh, uh, to share your projects with us. And you have also Immersion Day, which is uh, which are hands-on uh, workshops content uh, that are uh, pre-built for you to be able to, uh, uh, to, to follow a, a specific workshop um, through one half day or one day on dedicated subjects. Uh, if you need more information on this, don't hesitate to contact me. Um, uh, and if you have any more questions, I will be happy to to take them from here. Okay. Uh, if you don't, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for your time, and uh, have a good day.